Hey folks, welcome to another episode of the Wrench Turners podcast, a show that's about improving the life, well-being, and productivity of mechanics everywhere. I am your host, Joshua Taylor, founder of Wrench Turners Online, and today we continue our series with another recruiter, Mr. Stephen Adranya, Chief uh, Recruiter and President of Global Auto Staffing. Um, without further ado, why don't we just jump right into this? Uh, Stephen, thank you very much for taking the time today and uh, giving us a little bit of yours. Yeah, no, thank you for having me. Um, you know, I, I highly appreciate everything you do. It's very important to give every department in our beautiful industry a voice. So commend, you know, I commend you a lot for this too. So, uh, you know, again, thank you for having, having me and, um, you know, I, I'm really excited to get going. Awesome. So let's let's talk into this. So we'll we'll follow the normal rules of the podcast. So one of the things that we do is is what is what was your first? It wasn't your first year yet. We're not going to do that. What got you into automotive in the first place? And and sure. I'm not super clear on whether that was immediately into staffing or not. But what was your what got you into automotive at least? Yeah. No, I started um, washing cars at 16 years old. So I got in the business um, at a young age. I grew up in the car business and I in retail that is and I went through the trenches I've never was a mechanic but I was uh, uh you know I detailed cars I was in the parts department uh stocking parts um and the natural transition for me was like a lot of people sales <laughs> so yeah. I got into sales um very uh, 18 years old, my senior year in high school. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, been in it ever since. So this will be my 22nd year in, involved in retail in some way or shape or form. Um, general manager to exiting retail in around 2006, 2017 to be a recruiter. <laughs> and, uh, I really fully embraced being an automotive recruiter um, after a couple of years. I realized, hey, this is this is working, you know. And so I um, then we then kind of, you know, developed into executive search. We, we do at my company, Global Auto Staffing, we do all levels. Uh, so we we do our best to recruit techs um, mm -hmm. and what I found in my journey in recruiting is that the conversations that I have are some of the best in the world with candidates. Um, my being that the dealer is our client, um, I emphasize the importance, however, in communicating well with client or candidates uh, that come mm -hmm. through our, you know, our system. So global auto staffing has been around for about a year. Um, we kind of grew fast cause we do take on, we, we take on all sorts of different projects. We, we try to never say no to a dealer, right? So that's kind of how we segued into a full circle recruiting firm from C-level to, um, all aspects of the dealership, right? There's, and, and the vendor space and the supplier space, um, we've kind of gone into all that great stuff. But the real challenge that we f we hear is technicians. Mm -hmm. And so it's finding technicians. And, you know, because technicians as a whole are, are f very stable compared to most positions in our industry, right? And And what we found is there's some of the most hidden talent in a car dealership. So we, we try to make it about improving their overall experience when we're recruiting technicians, right? So everyone's going to want a technician. They're going to pay the rates that they want in theory. But we try to make it about like, hey, you could do this. Your skill is transferable to any dealer group, right? To any company. And we try to make it when we talk to technicians about, you know, whether it's culture and are you unhappy with your current culture and all the great stuff to really to really hone in on what they need and why they would want to make a, a change, right? Mm 
Okay, now bring this back a little bit just to make sure that we, we, we get the full picture here as to understand. So you experienced life in the shop, as it were, not as a mechanic, but right. started washing cars and experiencing detail and experiencing what it's like to be in the shop, necessarily working in the shop as a mechanic, but being in the shop around advisors, around technicians, around service managers, so on and so forth. And you spent uh, from say 22 years. So we, we both started around the same time, about 2001, 2002, somewhere in there professionally in, in automotive. We both effectively started in the same kind of way. I started pushing the broom and shoveling shit, right? The only difference is my specific goal was to be in the shop and turn wrenches. Right. Now, if you could kind of take me through the transition between, say, 2001, 2002 to 2016, where you decided to make make the change to go from the GM of a store to recruiting for stores, what was that first year like washing cars and dealing with the, the crap? What was the transition between that and moving into sales? Yeah. And why did you make the transition from GM to entrepreneur out on your own doing recruiting? Yeah. So no, that's, that's a, that's a great question. So it's, it's very similar because you're going into the unknown, right? Even though I knew the basics of recruiting, I, when I went from being in the shop, for instance, and learning parts service, that, that was the, the most fun time because the people in the back of the house, right? It's a different personality, uh, you know, different um, group of individuals, right? And then so segueing into when I exited retail as a GM, it was initially to create a better lifestyle for myself and my family, right? So we went through some stuff and I, you know, I had to really be home, right? And I had to figure out a way to where I could go from working 80 hours a week to being able to be on the road and do family stuff and find a, make a living. Right. So recruiting for me was something I had always had to do from the time I started as a sales manager to, you know, throughout the whole stages, because you're always looking for great people. Right. And that's kind of what's ingrained in us. And when, when, it, it goes back to how we all got recruited in the business. No one's, you know, we hear it a lot. Nobody's actually, but mostly technicians know what they want to do. I never really knew what I wanted to do because I jumped into the car, you know, I jumped into making money real early in life. And, you know, so the, the way we segued in, I segued into recruiting, it was really tough, right? I, I struggled for the first two years and, at some points, my wife was like, whoa, what are we doing here? <laughs> you know, so it's it's really important in when you are starting a new business is to really have a plan, you know, and have a purpose with that plan. And I we even talk about I even talk about with my candidates is like, hey, you got to have a you got to have a plan. You got to be different and you got to be relevant to what you want to do. Right. And I think that. um these transitions we make in our career, um, especially if it's, you know, like an example, a lot of technicians, they do want to make the jump into being a, a service advisor. They do want to make the jump into being a service manager. And we have to be able to embrace like our, our great qualities, right. And what we can bring. Right. Um, so what is a common, what is a common phrase that technicians who come to you or seek you out in some manner of speaking, <clears throat> looking for a way out. What is, what is the one thing that is the most freaking? Cause I know that there's a multitude. What is the one thing that takes the cake for them to want to transition from being a technician to being a service advisor? I have my own set. What's, what's yours? I think it's, I think it's, it's the entrepreneur mindset in a lot of technicians is that they want to grow their career. They want to grow. They want to be a part. So there's two sets, right? There's people that, hey, I'm like, if you're a salesperson or a technique, I'm happy doing that. But then there's the ones that are, that see opportunity and they're like, hey, I could do that better, you know, because their background, right? They, they know what they know. They know how to sell to a customer because they've actually done it. They can tell you what's wrong with the vehicle, right? They can explain it. And what I, what I think is it's, it's really um, 
the main thing I hear when I hear people wanting to make that transition is, is I can do it better. <laughs> and it's yeah. honestly is like, because tech technicians have a very, um, structured, they have to be very structured. Right. And they, they see the front of the, you know, the service advisors, the servicemen, they see chaos. Right. And they're very structured and they want to, they, they want to help. I've never, I've ran into so many technicians in my career. They're kind of standoffish at first, but then once you really engage technicians and you embrace their qualities, there's an entrepreneur in most technicians. And I, I, I've noticed that throughout my career, right? Whether it was in retail or recruiting is that they're very, you know, ambitious in the way they, you know, and they work really hard. So at some points, I think it does take a toll on the body too, right? And to transition into um, being a service advisor or service manager is, is, you know, very, very important to these particular people if that that want to make that transition it's that interesting right? how how different different people ask different questions to different people mm -hmm. i would not have said that the multitude that reach out to me are folks who are entrepreneurial right not not at all really now that might be because of what it is that I produce in terms of content, what I represent and what you represent. Um, it might be a multitude of things, but the folks that come to me are looking for, they simply want to find, they think for the most part, where they work sucks, their boss yeah. sucks, the team sucks, right. advisors right. suck in some capacity. And the challenge that I have is that they, they wanna instantly leave where they're at. Yeah, And the challenge, yeah then becomes getting them to understand that typically somewhere in the neighborhood of 80 to 90 percent of the time they are the reason why their environment is the way that it is right now is there is there poor leadership absolutely are there poor poor businesses absolutely are there poor teams absolutely and when you multiply those together you get a lot of businesses out there that suck yeah and it's unfair to a hard-working individual who genuinely wants to put in a full day, work hard, get paid properly for the work they're putting in and be able to, to provide for their families in a way that is not necessarily stress-free because the, you can't put stress-free and mechanic in the same sentence, no. but less stress than say working 60, 70 hours a week, 80 hours a week, like a, a top tier GM would and, you know, not be able to see their families and not make the kind of money they should be making. Right. So those are the kinds of individuals that see me and talk to me and getting them to understand that not to see a recruiter, right? Not to see a recruiter as a first step. It needs to be sure. the last step. Look at Absolutely. yourself in the mirror, understand what your capabilities are, understand where you're, where the places where you can learn and grow are so that you can be a better person and a better mechanic in the shop you're in. Now, once you do that, and then you're capable of having a, much more three-dimensional look at your surrounding area and go, Hey, these are the things that are going to change because I'm changing. Right. But these are the things that I'm trying to change and they're not changing and they're my hard boundary. Right. These are the things that are not being done that are outside of my control that I've asked for help on and I'm not getting the assistance I need. That's when you say, okay, now it's time to find another place of employment and maybe right. seek out a, a recruiter or maybe seek out a, a job board or whatever the case may be. That's, and that's the, two very different people that come to us. Right. Right. No. And that's, that's the, you bring up a huge, you know, it's very important to, for people, to, the grass isn't always greener, you know, and it's usually, I usually painted green, right? Yeah. I, I, I hear it all the time. And, you know, I, I hear whether it's a GM calling me, you know, I get a lot of, we get a lot of inbound candidate candidate calls and, you know, with technicians as a whole is I understand where they're coming. I don't understand where technicians are coming because I've never done it, but I have always seen it as, and even in our recruiting efforts, right? Like when we're look, when we have a great recruiter, 
I mean, a great technician, I'm sorry. And, and we're trying to find them a home, right? Because technicians, we can market, right? So there's no dealer that's going to say, hey, I'm not going to talk to you, a technician. But what they're going to ask is how much that we charge and, you know, what kind of flat rate. And it's the whole, it's become the whole thing. And that's why you see technicians bouncing right now, because they can go get the two, three dollars extra, right? And what I tell people in in that case is, you know, it, it, it really comes down to, can like you said, can you make it work where you're at, right? And if you can't, what are your holdups, right? And 90% of the time I hear that it's a mess, right? It's a mess where they're at, they're not happy, uh, they're not appreciated. And these are things that leaders in our industry need to really look at because we put, we tend, I can get more money in a fee for a sales role than I can for a technician, right? And I'm always, I'm always really curious why, right? Is, hey, you'll pay our company X amount for a placement fee here, but a technician is your biggest producer if you think about it, right? And you need them. <laughs> your business does not thrive without a strong without a strong tech team. And it's about finding leaders that and I would I would suggest this is if you find if if that technician can find an excellent leader uh, that they trust and that they really believe in, that's where I would go, right? I would that's go my find, first rule. Yeah. That's my first rule. As as a mechanic, your first rule, it doesn't matter whether it's city, rural, it doesn't matter what brand it is across the board, because in reality, if you find yourself a high value leader, you're going to get the tools, the resources, the assistance and the help that you need to be successful, right. period. End of chat. Now, is there a likelihood that there are certain brands that are going to be better? Yes. Are there places where a certain store size is going to be better? Yes. Is there a, a set of questions that I would ask? Absolutely. But the first and most important question that any mechanic and really anybody for that matter, the most important question you have to answer first is, is, is this person going to be a high value leader for me as a technician? Right. If the answer to that is yes. Uh, after doing your own vetting as a, as a individual, it's like, okay, this is the person that's going to supply me with what I need, not just the income per hour yeah. or whatever the case may be, but all of the other things that matter to me. Right. And this is also part of the coaching part of, of, of technicians is, you know, you're going into this thought process of possibly talking to a recruiter or, or, you know, seeking out uh, an interview from another place because you're thinking about money, right? Right. Typically the, the conversation is just about money and it's right. just about money. It's just, I'm not appreciated. I'm not appreciated. I need more money. Well, how, how's this? What if you went to another shop for less money, less money, but you got all of the appreciation you needed when you when you shat the bed in some capacity because we all do in some capacity sometimes it's minor sometimes it's major do you have instantaneous punishment or do you have instantaneous what's going on right. how can i help that we can't have this happen anymore how can i help you be more successful so it doesn't happen again what benefits do you need for your family right. what do you need to be successful outside of work if you get those kinds of questions answered, is the wage the most important thing or is it just another part of the question? Right. I think the problem is that we're not necessarily asking the correct questions and the correct questions in the correct order. Right. Because if you can talk to a leader or a recruiter and say, you know, let's say I'm a, I'm a mechanic, Steve, you know, I'm, I'm looking for, uh, uh, you know, I, I really, I really want to make more money that's probably not the best first thing to say to you. It's like, no. I'm, I'm looking for a better place to work. The place where I work um, is unwilling to clean the shop. Right. And I'm not getting the support I need in the really demanding tire seasons twice a year. I'm, I'm 45 and I can't do 15 sets of tires a day anymore. I can't right. be touching 60 sets of tires a day anymore. I just, I can't, I'm happy to be the person that, through those tire seasons, if you get, help me with an apprentice, 
through those seasons, I will be happy to train him through that period of time, right. but I need some help through that. Are you no, actually but, asking for more money or are you actually asking for a better working environment and a better leader? Well, it, it, it comes down to a lot of things too is, uh, but mainly it's, Hey, are, do you have the support? Are you able to find the support? And I talked to a really cool dealer group um, out of Florida. Uh, we had a, we had a, a technician out of Florida reach out to us and, you know, he, He's making quite a bit of money, right? And as flat rate, and his, which was kind of cool to hear it is his thing was like, Hey, we don't, we don't have, we're in Florida. We don't have a, uh, AC in our base, right? We don't have, we don't have, uh, you know, the, like a humidifier. So I was like, you know what? I never really thought of that. Well, I thought about it when I ran, cause we'd always make sure our techs had were, you know, had mm-hmm. the proper <laughs> care during the summer <laughs> when mm-hmm. it was really hot back there. And, um, you know, we had to bring in like our, own, you know, like those, those huge AC units and everything in the summer. Right. And I talked to this, it was an HR uh, VP of HR for a large dealer group. And, sh- and she was telling me how they had excellent, you know, they had all base had AC, right. They had, um, uh, you know, anti-humidifier or, you know, to take the humidity out of the air um, and, you know, water in every bay, <laughs> right? And making sure that they had, the techs have support. So the techs had to, instead of the sales team having the support staff, the techs actually have the support staff, right? And they're, and, and techs too, we got to look at the, the investment long term, right? Because you're putting a lot of tear on your body, right? So excellent 401k packages, employee matching, all that great stuff and benefits, right? Because you can get hurt. And that's what I find with this particular company. This gentleman wanted his, his flat rate rate was over 60, almost 70 bucks an hour. And, and he was very, you know, very, what? yeah, what? yeah. And, and I was Flat like, rate. yeah. And I was like, Hey, I, I don't know if I can, I can find you something like that, you know, but I did find a mm-hmm. dealer group for you that has some excellent benefits. So you got to look at the full package, right? When you're leaving too, it's not always about, Hey, how much money is in my pocket that day? Right. Do am I able to invest like, you know, have a 401k options or is there is there a future growth opportunity for me financially outside of that hourly rate or the flat rate, whatever, um, you know, the term is. But um, I think I think we we really have to as an industry is embrace the back end, the, the back of the house, the real back of the house, you know, the technicians. And, you know, all levels, right? It's, they're hard jobs, right? And they, they, they want to be appreciated, right? All technicians, they, they want to be appreciated. So I always think it goes to people too, right? It's not just technicians. I think one of the things that we miss, um, and I use the 80, 20 rule for every, for, for everything that technicians go through a lot of shit in the day, but so does everybody, right? Technicians go through a lot of shit in the day. And you think if, if they go through, even if they go through one, right, just one, and they have to talk to their supervisor or the team lead or the service manager or the advisor because something isn't right in some capacity. And whether it's their fault or not, it doesn't matter because it's, it's, it shit blows downhill. So you look at it, the 80-20 rule, in order to get rid of the negative energy, the negative mindset that occurs in any person, including technicians, you got to bury it in positive. Sure. And you do, it, we're not talking about handing out participation trophies, but we are talking about giving praise and appreciation and you have to do it at four to one. Right. You have to do it at four to one and you have to do it for every single member of the team, especially right. technician. Cause if you, if, if you can consider even just one a day that you have to fill their cup four times sure. a day in order to get them over the negative energy that whatever bullshit occurs right so that from a leadership perspective is what 
I, as, as somebody on this side of the coin, expect from you as a leader. Right. You have to fill their cup at least four times a day to get Absolutely. them through the slings and arrows of the job. If you're not doing that, things like, oh, I want more money. Oh, I need less time. Oh, I need more gravy job. It comes up because all they do, that's, I, I did it. Right. I did it. Oh, we all have. I, know I, did it. I remember so, when I was making a bunch of money and I was like, oh, I, you know, <laughs> I'm under pit. You know, we've all, we've all hit it at some point. And especially because we, we see the volume, we see the money coming in, in theory, right? And, and two, it's, it, it's really important. I will tell you this, a quick, a quick story. My stories sometimes go a little longer than I expect, but uh, I take over a Infinity Cadillac dealership as a new general manager. And I'm pumped, right? And I didn't realize... You know, I, I had seen the back of the house, right, a lot, and I appreciated it. But I didn't realize the battles between the departments. And I didn't realize that techs feel it the most, right? Because I had a, you know, this was, we're talking 100, maybe a little under 100 employees. We had um, about 10 techs, right? And... <laughs> The sales guys would always come into my, the tech did it, da, 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 you know, and the, then the re reverse, the service manager would be telling me those sales guys did it. And then one day I'm walking in the, in the, the shop and a sale, I hear a sales guy and a tech talking and I'm like, Hey guys, they're in an argument. Like let's, let's mm -hmm. simmer this down. And the tech looks at me and he goes, well, those, you know, in mm -hmm. sales, they're such da 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 da, and you know us back. I'm like, hey, I looked at him, and uh, his name was Jeremiah, and I looked at him. I go, we're all one team, brother. <laughs> and, and he and he kind of stopped in his tracks. He was like, I go, we're all going through the same you know same struggles every day. We all have to produce. We all have to work hard, and he kind of shrugged me off. Right. And I was like, okay, he, he, you know, I probably did. I did. I do something wrong. Blah, 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 blah. So it was 6 PM. He happened to come in my office and sit down and I rarely had any, you know, fixed people come in my office and want to just, you know, sales guys all the time. They need, they need <laughs> a lot of mental, <laughs> a lot of coaching. Right. <laughs> and the sales managers and everybody finance people. But he came in my office and he, he goes, you know, I appreciate what you say. And if you can really make a team atmosphere happen, then I'm all for it. And I'm like, well, it all starts with, you know, you believing that this is one team, right? And we're here to help each other, right? And we're here to make each other better. And we ended up talking for two and a half hours. And I think he was, I was like, it's 8, it's 830 at night. We got to go. But until then, I didn't really realize, I knew there was always turmoil, right? Because I felt it myself being coming through sales and everything that, you know, there's always turmoil, right? And as a leader, you know, you got to look at, you got to know what everybody's going through every day, right? Whether it's a tech service advisor, we're all going through, like you said, we're all going through the same struggles, right? We have to produce, we have to make sure we're taking care of ourselves, right? And so we have this really deep, and I actually learned a lot. He was like, hey, whatever you, you know, after we left, of course, we were buddies, right? He's like, hey, whatever you need to support. So the next day, I, you know, I had to ask ownership, but I thought it was like, hey, let's create like, because we'd have sales meetings, we'd have service meetings, we'd have, and techs are never included because they're working in the back, right? They're, they mm -hmm. can't stop, right? And so I, I kind of got everyone together and I said, hey, if everyone's willing once a month to show up at 6 a.m., you know, and we have a, we have like a sounding board meeting, right? And, you know, not pointing fingers, but like, hey, sales can do this better, right? Service can do this better. Uh, Text, you know, detail department can do this better. And, and we found that until you know people's story and their day to day, you really can't comment on it. Right, like text fundamentally, Stephen. That is why I created the survey. Oh, that's awesome. Why I created the survey 
for for two reasons. Um, one, you were able to garner influence enough to make that monthly thing happen. It's right. a shop meeting. Fundamentally, it's a shop meeting. Right. And for the most part, shop meetings suck. And for the most part, it's done, uh, for the most part, stereotypically, it's done during the work day, not before the work day. Right. Anybody that's, anytime that it happens before the work day, there's a whole lot of complaints and almost nobody ever shows. Sure. And even when they do show during the day, if it's during a during the day, there's very little feedback that's positive or um, or positive moving forward criticism. Not necessarily negative. It's very seldom positive moving forward criticism where this can have. It's not communicated in a, in a professional way where this specific example from this specific RO or this specific car, this is what happens. It can't happen like that ever again. Right. We need to come up with a process to fix it. And I, I come back to a, a phrase where most of the time those kinds of meetings occur because of a pressure or a stress to some team or some team member that shouldn't happen. Right. And instead of communicating it in such a way, for example, saying, you know, it's not my fault or my problem because of your lack of planning. Sure. And that sure. specific phrase said to most leaders of any department is what technicians feel most often. Right. So when this, and this is the thing that happens the most that happened to me, the group chat with my technicians, the coaching that I've had with technicians, when anytime that sales comes up, it's usually, Hey, I need to get this. I, I need to get, I need to get it. I need to get this done. <laughs> and then you know, there's no work or, and right. the second thing is there's no work order. It's like, oh, I, I, I'll, I'll get, I'll get the work. No, 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 no. I understand that you want to make a sale. I understand that you're on a time pressure, and I understand that the customer is probably here and waiting. Right. But so right. is the car that's on my hoist. Sure. And I'm flat sure. rate. Right. If there's no work order, I don't get paid. Oh, I said no. If there's no work order, I don't get paid. If there's no work order, it's not safe to be in the shop because then it's right. not. In, all the insurance bits aren't taken care of. And three, with you being in here with no safety glasses on, with no safety shoes on, you're unsafe. Right. You need to go up front. You need to talk to the service manager. You need to queue in the car properly so that we don't displace the paying customers that paid to be here right now on my hoist today. And seldom is that communicated in a polite, professional manner that everybody understands is not pushing somebody off. I right. want to help. I'm part of the team. But my job is to take care of the car that's on the hoist right now. Right. If there's no work order, there's no this, 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 and this, which is almost always the case. Always the case. Is, the, exceptions <laughs> are, the exceptions are fewer than they are more, right? Yeah, always so, the case. But that, but that kind of planning, and I understand circumstances exist on a regular basis where you got a smoking hot deal and a customer with great credit and all of the rest of it or cash in hand and you want to get it done. But that shouldn't interrupt the regular flow right. of people who either A, can't, or B, don't know how. Right. So communication yeah. and planning. So that's that's just one aspect of that. But I'm right. really awesome. Right. It was really awesome to hear that you had a conversation at length with someone and you had you came up with solutions. You came up with a right. plan going forward. You were able to create create processes for the shop to be more successful and make interdepartmental communication right. better. Well, you, you also too is that, you know, when we're recruiting is um, it's very similar, right? Is you have to find the need, you have to find what the, the candidate wants, and then you have to find what your client wants. Right. Mm -hmm. And if you can fit, and I look at it like we run, we run aptitude tests and it's not because I, I, I believe that personalities really matter in, in a, in all atmospheres. Right. And the, but you're never going to have a technician that matches with a salesperson in certain aspects, right? Is a technician is going to be very structured. A salesperson isn't you know, a, a true salesperson, someone that's like been doing it for quite a while. Right. Um, and what I, what I find is that if you can figure out even in recruiting is how to communicate with people, <laughs> that's all that really matters. Right. And, and you need to understand like why I emphasize the importance with my clients in aptitude, aptitude testing for not only their candidates, 
but for their whole staff so they could find out how to, you know, kind of mesh well, how the team can mesh well, right? It's all about team building, right? And technicians- so can- Attitude tests and personality tests are, are tremendously helpful at garnering fit, right? You know, we, you know, the Fix Ups Marketing, we did um, a char- uh, character test. I can't remember. Karen Gardner is our, our HR and she's amazing. And she found this, um, I think it's ISTJ or I don't know if you recognize it off the top. I can't remember the name of, of where we did it from, but right. we all did. And many of us, there, there was a whole bunch very similar. Like there was it kind of felt like there was a lot similar and, and our own in-house, um, we call it the learning center. Karen's built all of our onboarding stuff, all of our good to know stuff, all of our need to know stuff, all of the forms, the documents, all of this, it's all in housed in one place. And it's really awesome. I've never experienced this before. Um, I'm really happy to be part of that team and more importantly, to have everything laid out in a way that's a lot more structured sure. I'm a mechanic. I like things that are structured. <laughs> yeah, so, um, that said, th- all of our profiles, we have our profiles on that. So that everybody can see our process and it's only internal right. um, to see that most of the characteristics, personality testing and so on are, are similar or they're complementary. so that fit really is part it's interesting when you say fit is the most important thing, a part of a culture, right? And then you go into a team that actually thinks about it and thinks right. about it to the next level. And then when you see the objective data, not right. the subjective stuff, like a person's just choosing the objective stuff. That's awesome. Yeah. No. So it's, I really respect the fact you're doing aptitude and characteristic personality testing. That's yeah, awesome. We, we do it internal too. So we have six, uh, we're actually, we just, we just brought uh, someone else on board. So we're at seven staff, you know, people on for global mm-hmm. auto staffing. And um, it's it the peop the things you think people are really like their strong traits sometimes aren't their strong strict traits, right? So and that's what I suggest, like going back to technicians and jumping ship too early, is we we go back to Hey, maybe you're in a good situation, like you said, and we need to just figure out how to make it work, right? Mm-hmm. Because I That's think where I would come into play. Hey, <laughs> you're from a technician coach. What can I help you with? Well, no, I think I and I think even you know that's why you know I don't know if we were recording when I said this, but what you do is super important, right? And it's because people, you know, obviously I make my living off people jumping ship. Right. Mm -hmm. So, but at the same time is I don't want to, I, I'm not going to bring somebody in that first, like you said, that talks about pay right away. That's Mm -hmm. like my biggest, eh, we're moving Mm -hmm. on. Right. And, and because like pay is super important. It's, it's, it, you know, everyone's got to be well compensated for what they do, but it's too, it's like, Hey, how do I, how do I make, my um, career better? How do I, how do I decide what's the best fit for me? Right. Mm -hmm. And it really does. It really comes down to leadership, you know, and, and finding the best leader. Right. And I think where, where technicians struggle a lot too, is that the, they're not um, sometimes they're not in, embraced as much as a sales guy or a high performing finance guy will be right. Um, it's getting better from the way I understand it is, you know, it's getting better, but it's, you know, compared it to is getting better, early it's, it's, the challenge right now is that there is so much influx right. going on in terms of wages that it's very difficult to, to disseminate what is standard and what is not. Yeah. For example, through the survey, I've got over 500 submissions now. Um, I have technicians that make under $40 an hour as their base wage flat rate, but they're making over $120,000 a year. Right. I also have technicians who are flat rate and or uh, hourly that are somewhere in the neighborhood of $50, $55 an hour, but they aren't cracking a hundred grand a year. Yeah. So they're, they're, the, and the, the challenge in, in those both circumstances, you immediately infer that the person who is making more per hour but less overall is not as productive. Right. But then you take the context – you, you put context into play, and this is why I've got the survey to the, to the way it is now, 
is that they are a doctor of the house effectively, meaning they, there is no other training that, that the brand can give them. And they've got 20 years in the trade and they have probably $150,000 of tools. They are that person that helps the entire shop. They're that quote unquote working foreman without the title. Right. So they're making 95, 105,000, give or take somewhere in there, but they're going into work from seven o'clock in the morning till five at night, five days a week. And that's it. There's no extra. There's no overtime. They punch in and out for their breaks. They punch in and out for their lunch. Then no more, no less, but they are still just as a value member of the shop as somebody who's clocking 120% and doing, you know, 60, 70 hours a week of production. Right. They're two different people. Context matters. So when you talk about people who instantly talk about money first, getting the context really matters. But if the only focus is money, they're probably just persons like, I don't really want to work that hard. I just want more money an hour. Yeah. Right. That, and that's kind of that, what it comes down to. to be what the answer yeah. is. No. And you're, you're right. Because I think, you know, I think that too is um, when you see, when you see people that um, you can tell if someone's, just not a not happy person. Right. And mm -hmm. in a couple minutes talking to him and, you know, it's fine. Not everyone can be, you know, high energy all the time and motivational. Right. But when, There's when a I resilience there, to be, to be honest, a bit of resilience and, and that is lost over time through resentment and, and bitterness, because, you the know, one of the things that the, the, the res resentment's real, yeah. right. You get a technician that's been around for 10 years and has never been successful at getting uh, getting to work for a high value leader that's capable and and willing and does actually actionable stuff to help them be more successful Re resentment happens right i can name several that are in that kind of circumstance where they've never had the benefit of a great leader right the challenge then becomes you know is again it still comes back to what is more important is fit culture and mindset more important than money Absolutely. Right. To me all day long. Well, I, here's the thing is when I get a call about, you know, tech, we get, we get inquiries all the time about, Hey, technicians, technicians, you know, I need technicians. And my simple response is we could probably find you some technicians. You're going to have to pay for it and giving them a pay bump for the most part. Right. Um, but why don't you look at your leadership? Maybe you do need a new service manager. Because, and I say the same reverse, or the call. same concept, uh, just to interrupt real quick, the same thing applies to service managers as technicians, right? They need to look in the mirror and they need, they may just need coaching and GMs need to take heart too. that just because a service manager might not be the best fit doesn't mean that they couldn't be the best fit with a good right. bit of coaching. No. And I think owners understand the dealer principles, understand the importance of techs. Uh, you know, for the most part, I don't know if they understand, you know, what they go through, but I think, you know, cause we do get a lot of inquiries. Hey, we need more techs. They, they, they have to understand the importance, right? I had a dealer in the Midwest call me, I need 27 techs for our new bay. And I'm like, well, you know, I could probably get you three or four, <laughs> but 27 yeah. is going to be, that's, that's like, hey, I got to go work. We got to, I got to send my team over to go work for you full time, <laughs> you know? Yeah. So, so I think, um, you know, and, and I, I think there's a lot of 10 year techs, you know, I don't hear extreme, extreme high turnover um, when I'm, you know, having, yeah, we're, we're right now we're 53, according to Statista and kind of backed up by where'd I find it from? I think it's, um, wasn't indeed. It was one of the other ones. I think it was Glassdoor mirrored on the same metric where it's 53% of technicians are rolling every 18 months. So, oh. you know, 47% of the population isn't m really moving um, as, anywhere nearly as frequently. Like the, it's a stag the, the curve was fairly staggering. It was like 53% is 18 months, every 18 months. The others are like five years and above. Right. And one of the things that you can disseminate from some of that information as well and talking to a couple of other recruiters and, and so on offline is that there is a, a kind of a gap between two years and about five, six years, which is effectively COVID. 
right. where you have a whole batch of brand new green uh, technicians coming in that, you know, they're really excited to get in, really excited to get in, really excited to get in. And then they get burned out after two years and then they're out. Right. And then you, that keep happening over and over again so much so that we have a gap of a fairly large gap between the two year ish, two year ish to about five years plus. Right. And then we have another gap around the 10 to 13 year mark because the ones in that category are the ones that are going, this isn't getting any better. I'm not finding a good leader. I'm not getting the wages I want. I'm hurting myself because at 10 years, right? Most technicians are going to be around 30. They're wanting right. to start a family. They probably bought a house. They probably have a couple of car payments. And they're not making the kind of ends meet that they need to make in order to be successful. They're not making the cost of living. So they're going, okay, I've job hopped three times. You know, I've been at three different dealers. I'm still not making the kind of money I want to make. This job isn't really for me. I need out. Right. But there's so many variables in there for, for the average technician that it might just take one tweak. And now they're making way more money. And it doesn't necessarily mean they need to go to another store. Right. It might mean going to the store. It might be calling up Mr. Adranya and, and saying, hey, this I've done these things. I need a, a better job. And, you know, what what I'll do here is I'll lead this into because uh, I want to make sure that you're sensitive with time. Lead into a couple of questions here specifically sure. about recruitment, like that technician would potentially ask. So I've already asked other recruiters, you know, who pays. We understand that the inbound dealer or inbound store is going to pay the freight. Yeah, um, that there is typically some kind of also some kind of stay bonus typically or sometimes depending on how the contract works out. Again, the dealer would pay that. Um, one of the things that we do know is that or Mr. Feldman had suggested that his technicians typically go from start to finish in about four weeks. A dealer would reach out. They find somebody. They get somebody. They do the interview and da, 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 it's about four weeks. A – is that about the same for you? It's about four weeks in, in, in amongst that. Right. Would you say probably variable depending on the level with which that they're looking for? Yeah. So we do, we do, we tend to do a lot of relocation. So, mm -hmm. and because, you know, we don't act, you know, we have our client base and I can only take on so many search, you know, so many searches to, you know, so mm -hmm. I, I, I would say, uh, yeah, I'd say that's about right from from like start to finish, you know, you go through the process. But I, you know, I have a client in LA that hires people. He hires techs right on the spot. And he's taught, mm -hmm. he's Mercedes training. Hey, we got your Mercedes training set up in a week and a half, you know, and he gets them through the process. They actually like test them through. And I don't know what the, the what they do, but in scenarios, right? And they try mm -hmm. to have it all done because they and I, I tell everyone sense of urgency is highly important because if they're talking to me, they're talking to somebody else, you know, then they're talking Correct. to somebody else. So sense of urgency to make these quick decisions at the dealer level when you have a tech that you really like is highly important because, you know, once the brain's turning and once mm -hmm. Steve's got the brain turning or, you know, one a recruiter's got the brain turning or they saw a post, the brain's turning. So I suggest, you know, obviously for the technician, they got to make sure they're making the right decision for themselves. But on the dealer side, hey, we got to go. <laughs> you know, we got to we, we don't want if you really like this person, we do not want to lose them. So I'd say. I'd say depending how hard we're pushing, of course, two weeks notice and all that great stuff, yeah. uh, you know, that plays a major factor. Okay. So this is, this is one thing that actually recently came up um, in a conversation I was having, and I'm glad I had I'd already kind of prefaced it to you in, in some capacity, but I'd like to ask, and I think I'm going to ask everybody going forward, is what should technicians ask to make sure they are dealing with a top tier recruiter? And the reason why I ask you is that, like you just su suggested, there's only so many things you can do at one time with the team that you have currently. Obviously, right. you're growing your business and you've just hired on a seventh person for the team. So you're you're growing your business, but there is only so much capacity in your right. day. So if the technician, if a technician out there is listening and going, hey, you know, maybe a recruiter is gonna help me find the place, you know, a forever home, what what is one thing they should do or ask to make sure they're dealing with a top tier recruiter? Yeah. I we 
we don't only just try to convince people to go work. For, we, we make sure that you got to make sure that the recruiter is not worried about their fee, right? And what they're making and, you know, pushing you. You don't want to be like convinced to leave, right? You want to be given the pathway. Hey, it's a talk through. It's just like a coaching session, you know, is, hey, is this the right decision mm -hmm. for me? And, and anybody who's like wants to push you and get you to start right away. And that's their one goal is to collect, collect their commission is any, if you feel that right away, that's not somebody you want to work with, right? You want to work with somebody that's collaborative in your career, right? And wants better for you. And I believe at my company, Global Auto Staffing, we really, we, we really believe that people matter. And I, I want you know, if it's me or somebody else or my, you know, re other recruiters, it's, it's, Hey, you really got to, a technician's really got to find out if this person is just trying to, you know, look mm -hmm. good at their dealer, make money, or they, if they really care about me. And, mm -hmm. you know, that's, that's the most important thing. Okay. Awesome. I really appreciate you sharing that. That's, that's really good advice. Yeah. Um, I think that's a, that's a great way to end. I really appreciate you taking the time today, Steve. Um, Global Auto Staffing um, is a recruiter, a large recruiting business here. You can find them on LinkedIn. I'm going to make sure you folks can access uh, Steve and all of the recruiters that we're going to have on the show and make sure that the links and so forth to their website and, and to their profiles and stuff sure in the Spotify and the YouTube list below. I, I really appreciate you all. So thank you again, Steve. Really, thank you again. No, thank you for having me and uh, looking forward to uh, watching this. And all your all the all the, all the other recruiters talking. <laughs> I, I, I get I get really, really diverse. I got a really I won't say eclectic mix, but a, a a fairly good mix of both in and say around automotive to get perspective, so that everybody gets a, a good understanding of what it looks like, what how it works, and the people that are in it. So I really appreciate oh, that. I love so, it. Um, folks, love I think that's the end of another episode of the Wrench Turners podcast. Um, there is going to be another one coming next week. We've got recruiter series here all through June. And depending on how many more I add, maybe into July, we'll see. I've got quite a few set up. So I'm looking forward to presenting that to, to uh, you all. Don't forget Wrench Turner's merch. My mother loves her sweater. She gives sends me pictures like every other week. So please uh, check out the Wrench Turner's merch. The link is down below. Uh, Bi-weekly newsletter, the Wrenches for Wrenches, continues to grow. We've got almost 2,100 active uh, subscribers on LinkedIn. Check out the link below to check out the Wrenches for Wrenches for yourself. Comes out bi-weekly. We're also airing stuff from the archives now to bring stuff back. That's almost two years old. I can't believe wow. we're writing for that long. And uh, a quote to end the show, like we always do. This one was interesting. This is an interesting find. I found myself doing a lot of British uh, reading this week. So I found a, a very British quote from <laughs> Margaret Thatcher. Pennies do not come from heaven. They have to be earned right here on earth. Folks, negative pushes, positive pulls, and always clean your toys before you put them away. <laughs>